Behind the stethoscope and beneath the scrubs, a legacy of trailblazers has shaped the face of healthcare. A significant number of pioneering black men and women have helped change the course of healthcare and race relations in the United States since at least the early 19th century. They invented first of their kind medical devices, developed innovative surgical procedures, paved the way for improved patient access to quality care, and raised awareness about quality of life issues, provided leadership that improved the health of millions, saving countless lives and paving the way for future generations. Who are these unsung heroes who broke down barriers, defied the odds, and revolutionized the medical field? Join us as we uncover 10 Black American pioneers who changed healthcare. Number 10, Dr. Daniel Hale Williams. Dr. Daniel Hale Williams is considered as the first Black physician admitted to the American College of Surgeons. After apprenticing with a surgeon, Daniel Hale Williams earned a medical degree and started working as a surgeon in Chicago in 1884. Because of discrimination, hospitals at that time barred black doctors from working on staff. So Dr. Williams opened the nation's first black-owned interracial hospital, Provident Hospital and Training School for Nurses in Chicago. Provident Hospital offered training to African-American interns and established America's first school for black nurses. On July 10, 1893, Williams successfully repaired the pericardium of a man who had been stabbed in a knife fight. The pericardium is the sac surrounding the heart. The operation is considered to be the first documented successful open-heart surgery on a human. Williams is regarded as the first African-American cardiologist and pioneer of open-heart surgery, cementing his place in the 10 Black American pioneers who changed healthcare. He went on to co-found the National Medical Association and became the first Black physician admitted to the American College of Surgeons. Number 9. Dr. Charles Drew. Charles Drew advocated for equal access to healthcare for African Americans. While attending medical school at McGill University in Montreal, Charles Drew, a native of Washington, D.C., developed an interest in blood transfusions and the properties of blood. As a surgeon, he came up with innovative ways to store blood plasma in blood banks. Plasma can be preserved or banked much longer than whole blood. Drew discovered that the plasma could be dried and reconstituted later. Drew's doctoral research explored best practices for banking and transfusions, and its insights helped him establish the first large-scale blood banks. Drew directed the Blood for Britain project, which shipped much-needed plasma to England during World War II, which helped save thousands of lives as he oversaw the successful collection of 14,500 pints of vital plasma for the British. He also established the American Red Cross Blood Bank and served as its director starting in 1941, earning the nickname Father of the Blood Bank after creating the first Bloodmobile, a mobile blood donation truck with a refrigerator. But Drew's work was not without struggle. He protested the American Red Cross's policy of segregating blood by race and ultimately resigned from the organization when the Red Cross insisted on segregating African-American blood. He has already secured a place in our mention of the 10 black American pioneers who changed healthcare. Despite his renown for blood preservation, Drew's true passion was surgery. He was appointed chairman of the Department of Surgery and Chief of Surgery, and served as a surgeon and professor of medicine at Freedman's Hospital, now known as Howard University Hospital, in Washington, D.C., from 1942 to 1945. During his time there, he went to great lengths to support young African Americans pursuing careers in the discipline. He died at age 46 in a car accident. Number 8. Dr. May Jemison. May Jemison, MD, is most famous for becoming the first black woman astronaut to go into space in 1992. Jemison, however, is also a trained physician who has dedicated her life to improving global health. Dr. Jemison, a physician and engineer who advocated for STEM education, Dr. Jemison joined the Peace Corps in 1983, working as a medical officer for two years in Africa. Her work in the Peace Corps taught her about healthcare in developing countries. Later, as an astronaut, she learned about satellite telecommunications. She combined those two skill sets to form the Jemison Group, which develops telecommunication systems to improve healthcare delivery in developing countries. Jemison says she takes inspiration from Martin Luther King Jr in focusing on what she sees as unacceptable disparities in the quality of healthcare in the United States and developing nations. 
We talk about taking proper care of people, but we don't do it, she said at a dinner honoring MLK in 2006. We lack the commitment. Martin Luther King was about doing things. He didn't just have a dream, he got things done. She founded the nonprofit organization, The Earth We Share. Number 7. Dr. Solomon Carter Fuller. Solomon Carter Fuller's grandparents were medical missionaries in Liberia, and he grew up with a strong interest in medicine. After earning his medical degree in 1897 from Boston University, he became the first African-American psychiatrist, thereby paving the way for his contributions that made him one of the 10 black American pioneers who changed healthcare. In 1904, he began pioneering work with the psychiatrist and neuropathologist Alois Alzheimer. He one of five research assistants Alois Alzheimer selected to work alongside him in his Royal Psychiatric Hospital lab in Munich, Germany, studying the traits of dementia. Dr. Fuller was the first to translate much of Alzheimer's work into English, including research regarding August Dieter, the person with the first reported case of the disease. When he returned to the United States, Fuller continued research on Alzheimer's disease as well as schizophrenia, depression, and other mental illnesses. In 1912, he published the first comprehensive review of Alzheimer's cases. Throughout his illustrious life, he was an advocate for mental health care for African Americans. Number 6. Dr. Lewis Tompkins Wright Dr. Lewis Tompkins pioneered the use of antibiotics in surgical procedures. Born in LaGrange, GA, Lewis Tompkins Wright was exposed to the harsh realities of being African American in the southern United States during a turbulent, racially charged time in U.S. history. But Dr. Wright was also exposed to the presence of achievement within his own family. His father, Sia Ketchum Wright, M.D., was born a slave, but pursued education and received a medical degree, as valedictorian of his class, from Meharry Medical School, Nashville, T.N. After Dr. Lewis Wright's father died, his mother Lula remarried another African-American physician, William Fletcher Penn, M.D., who was the first African-American medical graduate from Yale University, New Haven, C.T. With encouragement from his stepfather, Dr. Wright applied to Harvard Medical School Boston, M.A. However, his experience in seeking admission to the institution was not free from controversy. Upon visiting the school for his interview, the interviewer, Channing Frothingham, M.D., realized that the applicant was African-American and had attended Clark University in Atlanta, a school that offered elementary, high school, and university instruction to blacks, not the Clark University in Worcester, M.A. After convincing Dr. Frothingham to have his abilities tested, tests that deemed the future Dr. Wright as having adequate chemistry for admission to this school, he was admitted and earned a medical degree, cum laude and graduated fourth in his class. Following medical school, his internship applications at three major Boston medical institutions were rejected, which led him to take a position at Washington, D.C.'s Freedmen's Hospital, now Howard University Hospital. He eventually went on to join the U.S. Army and served as first lieutenant in the Army Medical Corps, stationed in France, where he was given charge of the surgery wards at a field hospital. At the end of his military career, he was discharged as a captain and was given a Purple Heart after a phosgene gas-based German assault. Dr. Wright went on to have an illustrious career, serving at Harlem Hospital in New York City for more than three decades, from 1919 to 1952. During that period, the height of the Jim Crow era, he was a trailblazer for the rights of African-American medical personnel. For both his scientific work and his civil rights activism, he received many honors and awards. Dr. Wright's affiliation with the American College of Surgeons, ACS, began in 1934 when he was admitted as a fellow of the organization, an admission that brought much debate and division among ACS leadership and members. While African-American surgeons did apply for fellowship in the college and for membership in other national surgical and medical societies, issues of race often resulted in controversy and discord. However, the cause of getting African-American surgeons into the ACS was one that Dr. Wright was willing to face, and he became part of a group that actively worked to assist the process of admitting more black surgeons into the college. Ultimately, the effort was successful, and by the end of 1950, at least 38 black surgeons had gained ACS fellowship. Number 5. Dr. Jocelyn Elders. Minnie Jones, 
the eldest of eight children, grew up in a rural, segregated, poverty-stricken region of Arkansas. Her parents were sharecroppers, and she worked in cotton fields starting at age five. She often had to miss months of school in the fall when it was harvest time, but she still excelled at academics, earning a scholarship to attend the all-black liberal arts Philander Smith College in Little Rock, where she changed her name to Jocelyn. When she heard a speech by Edith Irby Jones, the first African-American to be accepted as a non-segregated student at the University of Arkansas Medical School, she was inspired to become a doctor. After three years of service in the U.S. Army, she attended the University of Arkansas Medical School on the GI Bill. While in school, she met her husband, high school basketball coach Oliver Elders. After earning her medical degree, Dr. Elders went on to become the first board-certified pediatric endocrinologist in the state of Arkansas in 1978. From 1987 to 1992, Elders served as the head of the Arkansas Department of Health under then-Governor Bill Clinton. When Clinton became president in 1993, he appointed Elders as Surgeon General, the first black American and second woman to hold that post. She became a controversial leader because of her willingness to frankly discuss issues such as drug legalization, in-school distribution of contraception, and healthy human sexuality. In the midst of this controversy, Elders was asked by the administration to resign in 1994. Number 4. Dr. David Satcher David Satcher is an American physician and public health administrator. He was a four-star admiral in the United States Public Health Service Commission Corps and served as the 10th Assistant Secretary for Health and the 16th Surgeon General of the United States. Satcher was born in Anniston, Alabama. At the age of two, he contracted whooping cough. A black doctor, Dr. Jackson, came to his parents' farm and told his parents he didn't expect David to live, but nonetheless spent the day with him and told his parents how to give him the best chance he could. Satcher said that he grew up hearing that story and that inspired him to be a doctor. While in college, he was active in the civil rights movement and was arrested on multiple occasions. Satcher served as professor and chairman of the Department of Community Medicine and Family Practice at Morehouse School of Medicine from 1979 to 1982. He is a former faculty member of the UCLA School of Medicine, the UCLA School of Public Health, and the King Drew Medical Center in Los Angeles, where he developed and chaired the King Drew Department of Family Medicine. From 1975 to 1979, he served as the interim dean of the Charles R. Drew Postgraduate Medical School, during which time, he negotiated the agreement with UCLA School of Medicine and the Board of Regents that led to a medical education program at King Drew. He also directed the King Drew Sickle Cell Research Center for six years. Satcher served as president of Meharry Medical College in Nashville, Tennessee, from 1982 to 1993. He also held the posts of Director of the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention and Administrator of the Agency for Toxic Substances and Disease Registry from 1993 to 1998. Satcher served simultaneously in the positions of Surgeon General and Assistant Secretary for Health from February 1998 through January 2001 at the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. As such, he is the first Surgeon General to be appointed as a four-star Admiral in the PHSCC to reflect his dual offices. In his first year as Surgeon General, Satcher released the 1998 Surgeon General's report, Tobacco Use Among U.S. Racial Ethnic Minority Groups. In it, he reported that tobacco use was on the rise among youth in each of the country's major racial and ethnic groups, threatening their long-term health prospects. In 2001, his office released the report, The Call to Action to Promote Sexual Health and Responsible Sexual Behavior, the report was hailed by the chairman of the American Academy of Family Physicians as an overdue paradigm shift. The only way we're going to change approaches to sexual behavior and sexual activity is through school. In school, not only at the doctor's office. In June 2006, Satcher established the Satcher Health Leadership Institute at Morehouse School of Medicine as a natural extension of his experiences improving public health policy for all Americans and his commitment to eliminating health disparities for minorities, the poor, and other disadvantaged groups, and thereby deserving a spot in the 10 black American pioneers who changed healthcare. In 2013, he co-founded the advocacy group African American Network Against Alzheimer's. Number three, Dr. Kizmekia Corbett-Hilaire. 
In early January 2020, the virus quickly spreading through China that had been making headlines since December was confirmed to be a novel coronavirus, a new strain in the same family of viruses that Kizmakaya Corbett had been studying for five years at the National Institutes of Health. As a senior research fellow and the scientific lead for the coronavirus vaccines and immunopathogenesis team in the Vaccine Research Center of the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases, the North Carolina native was in the perfect position to quickly respond. After the genetic sequence of the new virus was revealed by scientists on January 10th, before the virus was even known to have hit U.S. shores, Dr. Corbett's expertise on coronaviruses enabled her to prepare a modified sequence for a vaccine in mere hours, according to an article in the New York Times. By January 14th, the NIH had already shared her sequence with the vaccine developer Moderna, which started running its first human trials of the vaccine in March. By December, the new COVID-19 vaccine was authorized by the U.S. Food and Drug Administration for emergency use. The work of Corbett and her team of scientists contributed to the fastest ever development of a new vaccine, and one that was highly effective and easy to manufacture. The biopharmaceutical company Pfizer developed a COVID-19 vaccine using the same synthetic messenger RNA to fight the virus as the Moderna vaccine. And together the two vaccines have been administered to billions of people around the world, according to the World Health Organization. Following her success in developing the vaccine, Corbett was asked by the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health to head up her own lab in the Department of Immunology and Infectious Diseases. She also became an assistant professor in the department in June 2021, continuing her work as a viral immunologist with plans to focus on research for future pandemic preparedness and the development of universal vaccines. Number 2. Dr. Lonnie Bristow When Lonnie Bristow was young and growing up in Harlem, he often used to meet his mom at Sydenham Hospital, where she was a nurse, for the walk home. His exposure to doctors of all races in the emergency room sparked his interest in medicine, leading him to pursue a Bachelor of Science degree first at Morehouse College in Atlanta, and then at the City College of New York, and a medical degree from the New York University College of Medicine in 1957. After completing part of his residency at a hospital in San Francisco, Dr. Bristow started practicing in the Bay Area in the early 1960s, focusing on internal medicine with a subspecialty in occupational medicine. An advocate for diversity in medicine and affordable health care for all, Bristow was selected as the first black member of the American Medical Association's Board of Trustees in 1985, ultimately becoming the first black president for the 1995 to 1996 term. The organization had only started allowing membership to black doctors in 1968. During his time as president, he worked to advance many of the same goals he had throughout his career, including expanding the range of care doctors give patients, improving the doctor-patient relationship, and putting patients' needs ahead of monetary interests, according to Black Post. He also focused on sickle cell anemia, which affects black Americans at a higher rate than any other group in the United States, as well as coronary care and socioeconomic issues impacting health care. He saw his election to president of the AMA as an advancement for black Americans in the medical field and spoke frequently to future medical professionals of various backgrounds, encouraging them to strive for excellence in order to realize their dreams. His advocacy efforts continued following his tenure. As he wrote in his article, Diversity and the Road to the Land of Best Care in 2003 in the AMA Journal of Ethics, Every American should have access to culturally competent care if that care is to be truly patient-centered. Number 1. Dr. Jane Cook Wright The daughter of one of the first African-American graduates of Harvard Medical School, Jane Cook Wright, MD, grew up with a keen interest in health care. Her father, Dr. Lewis Wright, was also the first black doctor appointed to a staff position at a municipal hospital in New York City, and in 1929, the city hired him as police surgeon, the first African-American to hold that position. After earning her medical degree, Dr. Wright worked alongside her father at the Harlem Hospital Cancer Research Center, which her father established in 1948. Together, father and daughter researched chemotherapy drugs that led to remissions in patients with leukemia and lymphoma. In 1952, when her father died of tuberculosis, Wright became the head of the Cancer Research Center at age 33. 
She created an innovative technique to test the effect of drugs on cancer cells by using patient tissue rather than laboratory mice. She later became director of cancer chemotherapy research at New York University Medical Center and was also an associate dean at New York Medical College. The New York Cancer Society elected Wright as its first woman president in 1971. Her research helped transform chemotherapy from a last resort to a viable treatment for cancer. It's impossible to mention everyone in our 10 black American pioneers who changed healthcare. But as tuberculosis was ravaging New York City in the early 1900s, patients could not stay in regular hospitals. The Seaview Hospital in Staten Island, a tuberculosis facility that opened in 1913, ended up caring for thousands of patients who were unable to afford care at more expensive sanitariums. When its wards filled to overflowing in 1929, white nurses caring for the very ill patients began to leave in droves. To fill the many vacancies created by their exodus, the city recruited hundreds of black nurses from the Jim Crow South, enticing them with promises of an education, career, and living wage, as Maria Smilios details in her new book, The Black Angels, the untold story of the nurses who helped cure tuberculosis. But despite their bravery and tenacity in working in grueling and unsafe conditions, many of them got sick or died. They were underpaid and discriminated against, both in their neighborhoods and at Sea View. Tables in Sea View's cafeteria were marked for whites only, even though the hospital was one of just four municipal hospitals in New York that otherwise didn't discriminate against black nurses. Throughout their decades of work at Sea View, the Black Angels contributed to the development of Isoniazid, an antibiotic to treat tuberculosis, by administering the drug to patients and collecting massive amounts of data on how it affected them. In 1951, this data was part of a breakthrough trial showing the effectiveness of Isoniazid in treating the disease. Ten years later, Sea View closed because of lack of patients, and ultimately, the Black Angels helped to save tens of millions of lives. Without these black heroes, a lot of lives would have been lost to the illness. Reflecting on the achievements and the importance of the timely contributions of these pioneers' achievements, impact on healthcare and how their efforts made public the importance of diversity and inclusion in healthcare, it's important to remember the legacy of these black American pioneers. These people played a groundbreaking role in advancing and understanding certain diseases and ideology. How do you think world would have progressed without their immense contributions? Drop comments, like, share, and subscribe to this channel. Thanks for watching.